Picture this, you're watching anime, doesn't matter which one. You see a girl on the show that's obviously in love with the main character, but doesn't want to show it. She calls him an idiot, punches him in the arm, and otherwise abuses him, but nonetheless, she keeps blushing anytime he talks to her. That is a tsundere, a character archetype in anime that has officially existed for years now and has unofficially been around for far longer. They are increasingly common in nearly every piece of anime-related media nowadays. They have their diehard fans and their devout haters, and I have a problem with them. But the problem isn't actually with tsundere's, it isn't even with character archetypes or anime in general. I have a problem with the way we consume media, one that I want to talk about by talking about the death of the tsundere. But before I do any of that, this video is sponsored by Webnovel, the number one community for reading and writing web novels, comics, manhwa, and more. Have you ever wanted to read about magic, reincarnation, and powerful heroes? Well, Webnovel has a great selection of system stories, featuring protagonists with special abilities that cultivate their powers to become the best. My favorite is Reincarnated with the Strongest System. In it, the main character William is reborn into a fantastical world and given a system that lets them increase their level much higher than everyone else. With this power, they set out on a long journey, trying to find the meaning of happiness in their new life. And with over 1400 chapters currently out, this is a story you can easily get addicted to reading. There's also tons of other great picks on web novel too, like My Dragon System, Advent of the Archmage, and God Rank Upgrade System. But no matter which one you want to read first, you can do all that and more on the official web novel app for both iOS and Android. Just click the link in the description or head to the app store, download the app, and search for the word system. Thank you to web novel for sponsoring this video. Back to the episode. Tsundere. Kudre, Dandre, Yandre. The so-called Dere archetypes are all over the place in anime. So much so that I think it might actually be impossible to watch anything in the medium without stumbling into at least one of them. You see, they all stem from the term Dere Dere, which is used to describe someone who looks like they're in love. All of the words that are put in front of Dere are then just meant to represent the different ways that characters can express that love. So if someone acts calm and emotionless, that's a Kudre stemming from the Japanese pronunciation of the English word cool. If they act shy and timid, that's a dandre, stemming from the words danmari, meaning silence. Though if they're deranged and prone to violence, that would make them the incredibly popular and infamous yandre, stemming from yanderu, which means to be mentally ill. And then you have tsundere, which comes from tsunsun, a sort of mimetic word that's used to describe someone being grumpy, in a way that usually has them turn away from you in disgust. Which naturally combines with dere dere to mean a girl that initially comes off as mean, but eventually falls in love. Much like a lot of tropes in anime, the tsundere had existed for several decades before we made up a term to describe it. Characters like Sapphire from Princess Knight, Monsley from Future Boy Conan, or Sayaka Yumi from Mazinger Z all fit the bill for the first tsundere, though if you want to be pedantic and prove a point, you could easily trace the lineage as far back as you want. I mean, the fucking epic of Gilgamesh technically has a tsundere in it. However, unsurprisingly to anyone who's seen my previous video on anime waifus, the girl to popularize the archetype and bring it into the mainstream was none other than Lum the Invader Girl from Urusei Yatsura. Highly suggest you watch that video if you want more information on all this, though something I didn't mention in that video is that Lum's status as a tsundere seems to be an accident. You see, the original version of the Urusei Yatsura manga was a five-chapter omnibus that Rumiko Takahashi hadn't planned to continue beyond that. Every chapter would feature Ataru, the main character, meeting a different strange alien with their own story going on. Lum the Invader Girl, the princess of this alien planet, being only the first of several he was supposed to encounter. So as most people know, the first chapter features Ataru being challenged to beat Lum in a game of tag, which he wins by stealing her bra. This royally pisses Lum off, however, when Ataru yells out a marriage proposal to his girlfriend after winning, Lum thinks he's talking to her and says yes. It's a great joke, well-executed punchline, and that was supposed to be it. The next chapter then had a completely different alien show up and annoy Ataru. Him and his girlfriend don't even acknowledge the alien princess or the fact that he's engaged to her. It was entirely a one-off bit and the story moved on. However, the fans liked Lum and the manga so much that it continued to run for 360 more chapters, featuring the Invader Girl as a main character and love interest. 
Her reintroduction of the story is even caused when in-universe fans of Lum kidnap Ataru and beg him to bring her back, which Takahashi says she did out of spite in what might be the least subtle audience callout of all time. But because of this change in the story, something interesting happened to Lum's character. She was originally written in that first chapter as hating Ataru, bickering with him and cursing him out up until that marriage joke at the end. But with her reintroduction in chapter 3 onward, she's written fully in love with him, calling him darling and wanting to be his wife. A lot of the jokes that come out of her personality even come from the fact that she's too into him most of the time. And most of her abuse towards him from that point on comes from him rejecting her or being unfaithful. So out of all this, we get a character that was originally just antagonistic and abusive to now being entirely romantic and still abusive. And doesn't that sound familiar? Well, it should, because it's the exact reason why so many people cite Lum as one of the first tsundere's. And whether intentional or not, this archetype definitely stuck with Takahashi, who would go on to write much more explicitly tsundere characters like Akane Tendo from Ranma One Half. <laughs> Fast forwarding a bit, this type of character who's initially cold but warms up to the lead would get picked up by more and more authors and incorporated into more and more stories. It would continue to grow in popularity and become more ingrained in the culture until we'd finally get the girl who coined the term. You probably already know who I'm talking about. They should be the first thing that comes to mind when I say the word tsundere. That's right, I'm talking about Ayu Daikuji from Kimiga Nozomo Ayan. Oh, and also Asuka from Evangelion, I guess. Anyways, the visual novel, The Eternity You Desire, also known as Kimonozo, also known as Rumbling Hearts, released in August of 2001, was a fairly successful bishoujo game put out among a sea of similar titles at the time. The 90s and early 2000s were a boom for the anime-inspired adventure game genre, and titles like Canon, Two Heart, and the Tokimeki Memorial series were all massively successful. But what none of those games had, that Rumbling Hearts did, was a tsundere. Actually, that was a lie. Most visual novels had tsundere's in them, as the format of dating sims and bishoujo pretty girl games often necessitated breaking down characters into easily distinguishable tropes. There would often be half a dozen or more girls that you could pursue in each game, so you had to be able to pretty easily understand that this specific girl had this specific character trait, basically from the get-go, in order to be interested enough in her to play through her route. So more so than even similar anime at the time, like Love Hina, Inuyasha, or Fruits Basket, but shoujo games would condense and distill their characters' elements as much as possible, resulting in most of the official Dede archetypes as we know them today. And one of the more popular archetypes in these games would always be the girl that's initially cold and abusive who eventually warms up to you. Because if you're playing the game as the main character, you're the one she's warming up to. It's through your actions alone that she starts to open up. So to a lot of people, it's inherently more rewarding to pursue that type of girl than someone who might be more receptive from the outset. You are literally just playing on hard mode. And because of that, tsundere type girls would become a staple of the bishoujo game genre. Though it wouldn't be until August 29th, 2002 on the now defunct Ayashi World Forum that we would see the first recorded combination of the terms tsunsun and dere dere in a thread talking about characters from Rumbling Hearts. From the information I found, the thread actually starts off with an argument over the character Ayu Daikuji, who in-game is the daughter of the CEO of the restaurant you work for, and who is very rude and unfriendly to you until you get to know her. In response to this argument, a user writes, Don't ask me if I prefer Tsunsun Dere Dere or not, I prefer Mayu. Mayu being another girl in the game. This combination of Tsun and Dere would then continue to be used on Ayashi World to describe certain characters, eventually getting shortened to just Tsundere over time until a two-channel user would then post about how the term seems to have been coined there, and the rest is history. Because I don't think you have any idea how nice a restaurant this is. I know more than you think I do. You're an idiot. From 2002 into the late 2000s, the term would then slowly increase in popularity, as anime and visual novels would both expand and continue to develop the trope. The term itself would be used more prominently online, even in western spaces, the English Wikipedia page being created in 2005. And on October 30th of 2009, we'd see a massive spike in popularity on Google, which I have no explanation for. 
This is a tangent, but I spent an incredible amount of time trying to figure out where this one day popularity spike came from, even though it's not relevant to the video. If someone has any idea, please leave a comment about it. Yeah, here's my list of leads so far. Anyways, after this rise of the tsundere in the early 2000s and the several decades since then they've had to grow and change, you might have noticed a certain kind of online discourse pop up surrounding them. While there are still many people who adore the tsundere trope and eat up whatever character they find in new anime that has it, there's also an ever-growing list of people that hate it. They find it annoying. Yet the type of character they find annoying isn't usually the girl who slowly warms up to the protagonist. Rather, they hate the girl that blushes around him, gets mad, and then says this. So where did that girl come from? You see, even one of the first official definitions of tsundere, described by Patrick Galbraith in the Otaku Encyclopedia, specifically notes that it is not a character type, but a developmental process, wherein an icy character shows their warm side over the course of time. Yet that isn't what modern tsundere are at all. There is no process, there is no warming up. They're just like that. They bicker with the main character while having a crush on them. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> Several years ago, seemingly by pure happenstance, something incredibly strange would happen. Two scholars on opposite ends of the world, speaking two completely different languages and studying two completely different forms of media, would publish two books at the same time that both covered the same topic. Lev Manovich's The Language of New Media and Hiroki Azuma's Animalizing Postmodernity, both seemingly independently of each other, introduced the reader to something they call the database. In Manovich's book, they describe the database as this new way we've started thinking about media. Much in the same way that we now create content digitally, he says we also think about it digitally. Things are no longer enjoyed as part of a whole, part of a narrative, but rather as individual pieces that you can pluck out of the whole and plug in somewhere else. In Manovich's own words, Many new media objects do not tell stories. They do not have a beginning or end. In fact, they do not have any new development thematically, formally, or otherwise that would organize their elements into a sequence. Instead, they are collections of individual items, with every item possessing the same significance as any other. Really basic example, but the background music for all of my videos is often from video game soundtracks, many of which are from games I have never played. In using this music, I am ignoring the narrative that it was once a part of, the whole experience of the game and how the soundtrack ties into it. And I'm instead taking one element, putting it into a literal database of files on my computer, and pulling it out to put into the background of this video. And in Manovich's book, this is how they argue all new media exists. In Ozma's book, however, the database is described in almost the exact same way. Except instead of computer programs and American cinema as examples, Azuma specifically refers to anime and otaku culture, saying that Otaku don't approach a work just as a narrative. They also break the work down and focus on its elements. These can be elements of the production, such as characters and settings, or aspects of the design, or the artwork in key frames. As consumers, they want to know how the work is produced, so that they can break it down and reconstruct something else. So the way that people consume anime, as well as most media, for a long time has slowly shifted to being focused on database elements over entire narratives. If you've ever seen someone post a single clip of bad animation from a show and call the whole thing dog shit, you've seen an example of this. The tsundere, then, is one of the clearest cases of this so-called databasification. Characters like Lum, Asuka, and Akane were all narrative tsundere's. Their tsundere-ness was directly tied into the character arcs, which were tied into the entire plot of the show. You couldn't remove that tsundere element without removing their entire story. But with visual novels condensing these elements into more recognizable tropes and anime reincorporating that back into popular characters, the tsundere became defined entirely as a database element, as a single personality type that you could stick onto a character and enjoy outside of the context of the story. And do you want to know the crazy part? This entire argument, this entire revelation that I'm having right now, is about 15 years too late. First, do we comprehend the true meaning of the qualities of a tsundere? No. Unfortunately, the word tsundere has suffered misuse and decay, and one could say that the definition has evolved. To begin with, the word tsundere was born in the year 2002, an internet term. But the original definition was a character who starts off sun sun and eventually becomes dere dere. Yes. 
In other words, it was supposed to describe a changer over time. And now it's used to describe the multiple faces of a character. In other words, Sun Sun on the outside, and Dere Dere on the inside. I declare here, this is plainly a mistake! We must bring back the true meaning of Sundare and restore this depraved nation! Rise up, citizens! So everyone in front of the TV, yes you! Try to come up with a new word to describe characters like Kagami and rewrite the modern lexicon. We'll call it the complete Sundare debate. Lucky Star's post-episode companion segment, Lucky Channel, in its 10th episode, had one of the characters get into a heated argument about the definition of tsundere. One that may seem eerily like exactly what I was just saying this whole video. Yet this episode aired in 2007, way before I was making videos and before anyone was really talking about this on YouTube at all really. And those books by Lev Manovich and Hiroki Azuma detailing how people think about media in the digital age, those were published in 2001. The internet still sounded like this in 2001. So this transformation was taking place over two decades ago. And in the time since 2001, the internet has so thoroughly spread out and sped up everything we consume that the idea of data basification itself is old news. The Sundare, as it was originally defined, is long dead because the narrative is gone. All that's left are these independent elements, all of equal importance, all fighting for your attention more than ever. And this hyper data basification, as I'll call it, applies to every piece of media today. Take comic book movies, for example. Cinema, for the longest time, was an entirely narrative product. Yet Marvel movies are now entirely filled with interchangeable heroes and interchangeable stories that get swapped around to fit whatever the audience will best recognize. Not only was No Way Home a movie constructed entirely of different parts from other movies without context, but people watched the movie on TikTok in a bunch of one minute clips that were given to them out of order by an algorithm. If you look at the way people enjoy anime on social media, you'll see people break down entire shows into animation and voice acting and singular characters they like so often that you'd forget there was a story holding them all together. Even the rise of AI image generation and the cult around it is one entirely born out of the database. When you strip away the narrative of a piece of photography or art or animation and just consume that piece as lines and shapes on a screen, then of course you're going to be impressed when a computer can replicate those lines and shapes. It can't replicate the narrative, the emotion and humanity of creation, but that doesn't matter. To me, the story of the Tsundere is one that is incredibly complex and interesting, but it also represents something much larger. The death of the Tsundere parallels the death of narrative media. People didn't just change the definition of the term because of certain authors or trends or tropes, they changed it because media changed, the way we consume things changed, and that's important to recognize. So the next time you're watching an anime, doesn't matter which one, and you see a girl that's obviously in love with the main character but doesn't want to show it, think about the long journey we took to get there. Think about the trope that was popularized by accident, the term that was coined in an argument, and the changing media landscape that was predicted over two decades ago by two different authors at the same time. Because that is a Sundare. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, this is a bit of a shorter deep dive video from me, and it's actually a companion piece to my anime waifus video that I made almost a year ago now. So if you liked it, go check that video out. It gets way deeper into the histories of a lot of these anime and talks way more about a lot of the scholars I mentioned here. This is only a tangential subject in a much broader conversation I've been having with these videos. Though, if you want to see the full ad-free versions of this video, or any other, go check that out at patreon.com slash lextorius or my website, both linked in the description. It's only a dollar a month and gets your name in the credits like all these cool people. And you usually get all my videos earlier than you do on YouTube. In any case, thanks again for watching, thanks again to Web Novel for sponsoring the video, and I'll see you next time.